Hundreds of surgical fires occur in the United States each year. Preventing these fires requires teamwork and an understanding of the very real hazards of using oxygen in the operating room. This video presents new clinical guidance for preventing surgical fires. The new recommendations focus on eliminating open delivery of supplemental oxygen during sedation or securing the airway if the patient requires an increased oxygen concentration. Just going to put a little oxygen under your nose now. Might tickle a little bit. Is that comfortable for you? Okay. Do we have a surgeon? Do we need to give him a page? He should be on his way. Okay, terrific. Feeling sleepy and comfortable now, Andrew? Okay, everything's going fine. Are we ready to drape, Renee? Not yet, Dr. Rooney. We used an alcohol-based prep. It still needs some time to dry. Okay, can we please have our time out for patient safety? Please. This is Andrew Smith, MR number 5501328. He's having a right submandibular lesion excision, possible Z-plasty. Everyone agree? Yep, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Fire! Fire! Get the oxygen off. Pull the drapes down. Get some sponges and saline. I'll get the extinguisher. I'm concerned about an airway burn. I think I'm going to intubate the patient. Okay, I'll call ICU and get a range bed for him. Okay, that'd be great. Jeff, in all your years of practice, has anything like this ever happened to you? Not that I can remember, no. I mean, it's... No, uh, I even see it happened way too quickly. It scared the hell out of me. It was under the drapes. You couldn't even tell really what was going on. This surgical team did not understand the true level of fire risk for this procedure. Surgical fires can be prevented, and in the vast majority of cases, it is all about careful attention to oxygen delivery. Based on ECRI Institute's analysis of extensive state-based medical adverse event reporting data, there are an estimated 600 surgical fires per year in the U.S. Most are minor. However, some result in serious injury, disfigurement, or even death. With every surgery, there is a risk of fire. Some procedures are more risky than others. Surgical fires have occurred in or on all parts of the body, but the majority of such fires involved areas where high oxygen concentrations were present. These potentially oxygen-enriched areas include the head, face, neck, and upper chest, which account for approximately 65% of surgical fires. The remaining 35% occur elsewhere on or in the body. Fires occur when an ignition source, a fuel, and oxygen come together. Each member of the surgical team should be aware of these three elements and their related fire risks. Surgeons typically use ignition sources, such as electrosurgical pencils. OR nurses help apply PrEP solutions and other potential fuels. And anesthesia professionals control the delivery of oxygen and nitrous oxide. The entire surgical team should discuss the risk of fire for every patient. A pre-op timeout is the ideal time to identify fire risks and coordinate preventive methods. Oxygen enrichment is the most significant factor contributing to surgical fires, especially during surgery of the head, face, neck, airway, and upper chest. Many items that will not burn in room air will easily ignite and burn in the presence of an enriched oxygen atmosphere. In the surgical setting, nitrous oxide is as dangerous as oxygen in supporting fires. Fires burn hotter and faster in the presence of increased oxygen concentrations, or nitrous oxide. To reduce the risk of excess oxidizers, 
the patient's oxygen needs must be considered. Routine delivery of supplemental oxygen using an open source, like a nasal cannula, during head and neck surgery increases the oxygen concentration in the surgical field and increases the chance of fire. To prevent fires during sedation with a natural airway, we need to ask the question, is supplemental oxygen really necessary for this patient? Many patients can be sedated safely and effectively without supplemental oxygen. For patient comfort in these cases, air can be delivered to the patient via a nasal cannula or mask. Oxygen saturation monitoring with a pulse oximeter should be used as always to ensure adequate oxygenation. If supplemental oxygen is required to maintain adequate patient oxygenation, then the airway must be secured with a tracheal tube or laryngeal mask airway to keep oxygen from entering the surgical field. There are, however, some surgical procedures around the head, neck, and upper chest where conscious sedation is required and oxygen delivered by nasal cannula or mask may be required to maintain adequate oxygen saturation. These may include cases where the sedated patient needs to be able to speak during the procedure, such as carotid artery surgery, neurosurgery, and some pacemaker implantations. There also may be unusual cases where the risk of securing the airway for a minor procedure is greater than the risk of careful open delivery. When delivering oxygen by nasal cannula or mask in such exceptional cases, you should not use the auxiliary oxygen flow meter, which is only capable of delivering 100% oxygen. The goal is to deliver the minimum concentration of oxygen necessary to maintain adequate oxyhemoglobin saturation. Restricting the delivered oxygen concentration to 30% or less will minimize fire risks during exceptional surgeries and may provide an acceptable oxyhemoglobin saturation, but room air is preferred whenever possible. There is no risk of a flash fire if the oxygen concentration is less than 30%, but many items that do not burn in air will burn in 30% oxygen. Three options are recommended for blending oxygen with air during exceptional surgical cases where open oxygen delivery is essential. The most reliable approach is to use an air oxygen blender to provide the gas to the nasal cannula or mask. The primary advantages are that the oxygen concentration is selected directly and that these devices are accurate. However, although commonly available in other areas of the hospital, air oxygen blenders may not yet be present in many anesthetizing locations. Alternatively, use a three-gas anesthesia machine one with air oxygen and nitrous oxide that has a readily available common gas outlet and take the blended gas directly from the outlet. Be careful about the ratio of oxygen and air used. You must remember that it takes very little oxygen added to air to enrich the oxygen concentration beyond 30 percent. For example, adding only 200 milliliters per minute of oxygen to 1.8 liters of air creates an oxygen concentration of 29 percent. However, newer anesthesia machines may not have an available common gas outlet. For three gas anesthesia machines without an available common gas outlet, delivery of blended air and oxygen via the patient Y is possible. For faster changes in oxygen concentration delivery, close the APL valve. This technique has the advantage of being able to measure the concentration of oxygen delivered by the flow meters using the oxygen concentration monitor. Regardless of which open delivery method used, if you first deliver 100% oxygen with the intent of later lowering the concentration prior to using an ignition source, it may require several minutes to reduce the oxygen concentration delivered to the patient and accumulating under the drapes. Furthermore, the actual oxygen concentration at the surgical site is not known when using open oxygen delivery. You should always start with the lowest oxygen concentration required to keep the patient safe. The delivery of 5 to 10 liters per minute of air under the drapes can wash out excess oxygen. Use of alternate surgical modalities such as a scalpel bipolar electrosurgery or harmonic scalpel can remove the ignition risk. Incised drapes may, in some cases, help isolate oxygen from the surgical site. Draping techniques, such as open draping, 
where the face is only partially covered or not covered at all, have been advocated to reduce the risk of oxygen accumulating under the drapes and flowing into the surgical site. Be aware, these techniques should only be used for exceptional cases since they do not fully eliminate the surgical fire risk when delivering oxygen above 30%. To summarize, the preventative methods that can be used for exceptional cases include blending air and oxygen, diluting the underdrape space with air, using alternative surgical modalities, and using modified draping techniques. Like oxygen-enriched fires, alcohol-related fires can cause serious injury. Alcohol-based prep solutions burn readily in room air, and the fires are hard to see. Fires with any alcohol-based product can cause serious injury. If you use a prep solution containing alcohol, it must be allowed to dry completely before draping. The same holds true for any tinctures or flammable dressing, such as collodion. They must be allowed to dry before use of an electrosurgical pencil or other ignition source near them. Many other surgical items burn vigorously in the presence of enriched oxygen. If you ensure that excess oxygen is not enriching the surgical site and allow alcohol prep solutions to dry completely, you will be able to prevent most surgical fires. Many commonly used surgical instruments produce heat, but must be used to accomplish the procedure. Since the potential ignition source often cannot be eliminated, it is essential to control the oxygen concentration at the surgical site so that the risk of fuel ignition is reduced. So let's see how our earlier fire could have been avoided. Okay, can we please have our time out for patient safety? Certainly. Mm -hmm. This is Andrew Smith, MR number 5501328. He's having a right submandibular lesion excision with a possible Z-plasty. Everyone agree? Yes. I agree. Mm -hmm. Is there a risk for fire for this procedure? Well, possibly. We are using a cautery pencil. I am delivering air only through the nasal cannula and monitoring CO2. Okay, great. If I have to increase the oxygen, I'll let you know. If you do administer, I'll be sure to give you a heads up before I cauterize. Perfect. We did use an alcohol-based prep, but it was dry before we draped. That's great. Terrific. Scalpel, please. Awareness of the fire hazards and team communication are key to surgical fire prevention. Everything went smoothly. You should be able to prevent surgical fires if you eliminate an increased oxygen concentration and any alcohol vapors from the surgical site. However, if a fire does occur, rapid teamwork is required to minimize injury. The anesthesia professional should remove any source of oxygen from the fire. The surgeon and scrub nurse can pull off the burning drapes while another staff member pours saline on and around the patient to douse the fire. The circulator can use a fire extinguisher to put out the burning drapes if needed once they are removed from the patient. It will be a rare occasion when a fire extinguisher needs to be discharged directly on the patient. Airway fires are especially hazardous and require a rapid response to remove the burning materials and minimize patient injury. For a fire in the airway or breathing circuit, saline should be poured into the patient's airway to extinguish any residual embers and cool the tissues. Airway fires are also preventable by controlling the oxygen concentration. Fires during tonsillectomy can occur when oxygen or nitrous oxide are present in high concentrations in the oropharynx. The risk of fire is reduced by using an oxygen concentration less than 30% without nitrous oxide and using a tracheal tube that does not leak. If an oxygen concentration greater than 30% or nitrous oxide is used, suction deep within the oropharynx with a metal cannula prior to using electrosurgery. During tracheostomy, patients often require increased oxygen concentrations to avoid hypoxia. Fires may occur when the oxygen-enriched trachea is entered with an electrosurgical instrument. A scalpel or scissors should be used instead to enter the oxygen-enriched trachea. During surgical bronchoscopy, fire can occur when a laser fiber or electrosurgical device is activated in the oxygen-enriched lung. Oxygen concentration should be reduced to less than 30% when the surgical device is activated. 
Inspired and expired oxygen monitoring will confirm the desired concentration. High gas flows should allow for rapid reduction of oxygen concentration to facilitate surgery and rapid increase in oxygen concentration to avoid prolonged hypoxia. Surgical fires are preventable. The risk of surgical fire should be discussed by the operating room team. If an alcohol prep solution is used, it must be allowed to dry completely before draping. Open oxygen administration for surgery of the head, face, neck, and upper chest is not recommended. The oxygen concentration at the surgical site must be controlled. For patients requiring supplemental oxygen, control the airway with an LMA or tracheal tube to exclude oxygen from the surgical site. Possible exceptions are surgeries where a patient needs to speak during the case and when supplemental oxygen is needed. If a fire does occur, rapidly remove burning materials from the patient to reduce injury while simultaneously disconnecting the breathing circuit from the patient. With attention to teamwork and knowledge of the causes of fires, prevention should be successful. Several references are available for additional information on this topic, including an online continuing medical education course. Thank you for your attention.